no one else was able to find apparently. So I was still that uh, So, but I've been, you know, touching on events that I knew nothing about for 10 years before, if you understand, for a long time here. I've been studying. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to uh, Hellenic House. My name is Nikola Rigakis, and uh, we're pleased today to have another edition of our Noon Forum series. We are expecting a number of more people to show up, but I guess uh, the traffic is ha hasn't uh, bogged down. That or the government shut down, one of the two. Um, today's forum will touch upon the commemoration of the 91st anniversary of the Zmirna catastrophe of 1922. And it is a real pleasure to have with us here today Dr. Robert Shank, Professor of English at the University of New Orleans, uh, who will present today's forum. The tragic events of 1922 are important to commemorate because they remind us of man's inhumanity to man. And hopefully, if there's a silver lining, will serve as a deterrent for similar atrocities from occurring again. Unfortunately, we do see egregious human rights tragedies occurring in the world today just as they did in Smyrna in 1922. At that time, governments stood idle, failing to act. In pausing a moment to take time out of our busy schedules to remember Smyrna, we hope we are taking a step to halt this plague of human rights abuses and genocide that we still have, unfortunately, within our midst today. And what I'd like to do now is to uh, call on our uh, AHI board member, James Marquetos, who will introduce uh, today's speaker, and Jim does trace his roots back to Asia Minor. Jim, welcome, and I give you the floor. Thanks, Nick, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, uh, as most of you know, for nearly 100 years after modern Greece's foundation, its foreign policy was shaped by something called the great idea, the dream of expanding the Greek state to uh, encompass all territory containing substantial Greek populations. That territory included Asia Minor, uh, which had been home to large numbers of Greeks from ancient times. The heart of Asia Minor's Greek community was Smyrna, a natural deep water port. In the first decades of the 20th century, and despite the Ottoman Empire's general decline, uh, the uh, Smyrna remained a rich, sophisticated commercial hub. It was a cosmopolitan uh, amalgam of Greeks, Turks, Armenians, Jews, Europeans, and even some Americans. Today, we remember the destruction of Smyrna and with it the catastrophe of the modern Greek nation, the decisive collapse of the great idea. According to credible eyewitnesses, 91 years ago, uniformed Turkish soldiers started a seaside holocaust that swept through the Armenian, Greek, and most of the European quarters of the city. In a horrific confluence of flames and terror, the nearly 2,000-year-old Christian presence in Asia Minor was wiped out in a matter of days. The U.S. Navy played a vital role in the humanitarian tragedy that followed, and we are fortunate to hear about it today from Dr. Robert Schenk. Uh, he brings to the tragic events of late 1922 the experience of a Navy man. He's a retired captain in the U.S. Naval Reserve and the rigor of a professional scholar. He's professor of English at the University of New Orleans. His inspiration was Marjorie Husepian Dobkin, our noon forum speaker on this same occasion in 1998. Her gripping book on Smyrna is still a leading source on the subject, and she encouraged Dr. Schenk to search for naval accounts beyond the official reports and to go even more deeply than she had into the Navy's important role before, during, and after the Smyrna fire. He's done so, and the fruits of his 10 years of research in war diaries, private family memoirs, and other first-hand accounts never previously <coughs> published are now available in his new book, America's Black Sea Fleet, the U.S. Navy Amidst War and Revolution, 1919-1923. For those of you who are interested in this period of history, you should know that the book goes well beyond the Smyrna tragedy. Also covered are the white Russian exodus following the Bolshevik Revolution, the demise of the Pontian Greeks, and the Armenian tragedy of Cilicia. Uh, 
And there's more than just a chronicle of the significant role played by the U.S. Navy in these important historical events. On lighter notes, and from the pens and mouths of American sailors and officers themselves, we witness intimate scenes of shipboard life, and we experience the raucous after-hours distractions of exotic Constantinople during the early years of the Roaring Twenties. Perhaps most importantly, Dr. Shank's book describes the crucial role played by Admiral Mark Bristol, the U.S.'s highest-ranking naval officer and chief diplomat in the region. He explains how Admiral Bristol's unabashed favoritism of the Turkish nationalists and his elevation of U.S. commercial interests in Turkey over humanitarian, educational, and religious ones set U.S. policy in the region on the course it generally still follows to this day. Speaking to us today about key decisions during the Smyrna crisis, September 1922, please welcome Dr. Robert Schenk. Thank you, Jim, and thank you all for inviting me here. Um, as most of you know, I'm sure, immediately after World War I, dozens of American Near East relief teams scurried throughout Turkey and Armenia uh, to help all the survivors of what we all call the Armenian Genocide. American Navy ships were sent to Turkey as well to help transport those relief teams and to support other Americans in the area, which included many missionaries at mission stations that had been established throughout Turkey by the Congregationalist Church during the 19th century. The American Navy was headed up by Admiral Brant Mark Bristol. Bristol much, was much less interested in the religious outreach or in the relief work to which some Americans, many Americans had committed themselves, though he supported both. And he was, in the growth of American business enterprises throughout the Black Sea region, his special care and pride. For four years, some 40 or 50 Navy destroyers served about ten, six months' duty apiece in the area, with a home port at Constantinople, modern Istanbul, <coughs> on the Bosphorus Strait. They steamed throughout the Black Sea and Aegean and called it major ports both in Turkey and in southern Russia. My own background, is, as you've heard, is partly naval. Um, I served on river patrol boats in Vietnam and on a destroyer um, off the coast of um, South China's in the in the South China Sea. Like many modern naval officers, I had no idea there had ever been such a thing as a small Black Sea fleet, American ships. Having become fascinated by re reading a newly discovered diary of a young officer who had spent six months in Constantinople, I began to study the period. On reading the late Marjorie Halsepian Dawkins' fine book, I soon realized the central crisis faced by the small American fleet in Turkish waters was, of course, the burning of the great city of Smyrna. The terrible suffering and great loss of life that was inflicted upon ethnic Greeks and Armenians at the hands of the Turks at Smyrna eventuated in a great rescue, partly led by men and officers of the American Navy. This despite Admiral Bristol's opposition to his ships helping in any significant way. Some 190,000 were eventually saved in that rescue, though many more could have been saved had the Admiral been more of an even-handed, unbiased, and charitable officer. Let me go into this issue a just a bit. As I'm sure you know, in 1919 and 1920, with the initial encouragement of the Allies, a Hellenic Greek army pushed its way into the middle of mainland Turkey, with the object under the Greek premier Venizelos of establishing a kind of Greek empire by adding the Greekish parts of western Turkey, Smyrna and surrounding regions, to Greece proper. When after two years of warfare, the Turkish nationalist army of Mustafa Kemal defeated the Greek army and began marching towards Smyrna, Admiral Bristol issued directives to naval ships and officers that the Americans in Smyrna were to be utterly neutral. These directives handcuffed the Admiral's on-the-scene commander, Captain J.P. Hedburn. Be neutral. Protect only Americans. Don't cooperate with the Allies. Don't lead the way. So the Admiral ordered Captain Hepburn, who commanded the three destroyers and the officers and men the Admiral had sent to the port. Why did that Bristol so limit his on-the-scene commander and effectively prevent any American humanitarian operations? Partly because the Admiral was all about promoting American business, and what business needed was friendship with the Turkish authorities. The Admiral had been courting the Turkish nationalists since they first began to make noise in mainland Turkey in late 1919. 
Bristol had gone out of his way to help the white Russian refugees when in March of 1920, 150,000 of them evacuated the Crimea and fled across the Black Sea and down the Bosphorus Strait to Constantinople, one of the great final cataclysms of the great Russian Revolution. The Admiral had sent Navy ships to help directly in that evacuation. Now, though, despite the suffering and terror of 400 to 700,000 ethnic Greek and Armenian residents and refugees in Smyrna, Bristol directed his destroyer men there only to help Americans who, was, who were living, living there. Because of Admiral Bristol's directives, when the three American destroyers arrived, their officers knew they were not to cooperate with the two dozen European warships in harbor, many of whose vessels dwarfed the American si ships in size, gun capability, and manpower. The British had battleships in harbor, for instance. All of these ships were anchored in the harbor, observing the waterfront of that great city. The waterfront was fronted by the great Smyrna Quay, as I'll pronounce it here, Q-U-A-Y, or Q-U-A-I, a marine spot and large boulevard stretching a mile and a half along the waterfront, roughly 30, miles, uh, 30 yards in width. This beautiful, busy city that sported such a unique waterfront had that mixed population of what you've heard, of Greeks, Turks, Armenians, Jews, Levantines. Indeed, at the time, Smyrna was one of the most truly cosmopolitan cities in the world. Now that the Turkish army had crushed the Greek army, though, uh, it wasn't going to be as beautiful uh, or as, um, uh, as busy in its, that way as it once had been. Although not all of the Greek army got away from the Turkish army, thousands, many thousands, maybe tens of thousands were captured. Those Greek tr troops who had been able to flee the Turks had been evacuated by transports that had moored near Smyrna. Some uh, Greek army stragglers were still nearby when on September 9, 1922, the first Turkish cavalry troops entered the city and rode down the famous quay. It was the first cohort of many thousand Turkish nationalist troops which would pour into the, pour into the city over the next weeks. As day wore on, the Turks who came were more and more bandit groups, only barely under the discipline of Turkish regular forces. It did not help, of course, that as the Greek army retreated, Treated that army had been abandoned by its officers. Those Greek soldiers had burned down the villages they went through in order to slow the Turkish army's advance. They had also forced the Greek villagers to abandon their homes and rush with them toward the Aegean. Two years' war, much Turkish propaganda, all those burning villages, and the several days of pillage traditionally allowed the members of a conquering army ensured that terrible things would soon occur. But no one took measures to prepare for what was to come, Indeed, few military people seem to have recognized the potential catastrophe that was at hand. Nothing the Admiral had told him prepared Captain Hepburn and his destroyer captains for the horrors they were about to witness. The Admiral actually insisted that the Greeks and Armenians should be encouraged to stay in their homes and continue to live under Turkish rule, in which his guidance was the exact opposite to that of the longtime American consul in Smyrna, George Horton, there was even a book on, your, on these shelves here of George Horton's recollection of what was going on there. Um, indeed, not long before, uh, after Bristol was issuing his utter neutrality orders to his officers and asserting that all Christian minorities who lived in Turkey should stay there, Horton was cabling the State Department to this effect. There is one thing, one point I wish to make to the very plain to vouch for in my absolute knowledge and authority, these people can never return to their homes. Horton knew the racial antagonisms and the Turkish modus operandi far too well to have any doubts. In the Armenian genocide directed by the Turkish government under cover war in 1915-16, to 16, the Turks had killed maybe a million and a half Armenians and many ethnic Greeks as well. Now, in addition, there had been the two, year, two plus years of the Hellenic Greek occupation of much of Western Turkey, hugely resented by the Turks, and the smoke of all those villages just burned by retreating Greek troops. In his cable to officials in Washington, Consul Horton concluded, here then is the big humanitarian task in which there is no reason, political or otherwise, that America should not take a hand. He went on to outline a plan for assembling the refugees 14 miles outside of Smyrna as a staging place for their evacuation, a plan that had been drawn up by American relief workers at Smyrna who manifested considerable prescience as well as human feeling 
unlike both the unfeeling and naive American Admiral. But Captain Hepburn turned his main attention to care for, and if need be, evacuate American civilians living and working in the region. Partly because he was handcuffed by his orders, and partly because he didn't see the need for any such radical humanitarian action as Consul Horton recommended, the captain did nothing towards setting up the wholesale evacuation or anything of the kind. Meanwhile, as the Turkish army entered the city, what was going on in Smyrna? Let me share you with some contemporary reports from American civilians and especially native people. Though storefronts soon sh shut up after the Turkish cavalry column arrived, Hepburn thought the initial panic had subsided quickly. However, Lieutenant Commander Can Harry Knaus, captain of the USS Simpson, who was now heading up the Navy shore patrol, found that Amer the Armenian quarter had quickly become infested with shooting parties, Turkish civilians armed with rifles and shotguns. There, according to the destroyer captain, the real killing had already begun. And I quote, on nearly every street were lying bodies of men of all ages and conditions, most of whose wounds were from rifles and close-range shots, as they were invariably shot in the face or the back. Commander House personally witnessed three executions that day. Seeing such things, hosts of Greek and Armenian civilians and refugees began to push their way into every building that flew in an American flag. By nightfall, again, I'm just talking from the American uh, and especially the naval side of this. By nightfall, a thousand people had forced their way into a girls' school called the American Collegiate Institute, and 500 were at the YWCA with its large courtyard. The sailors guarding these places had their hands full just keeping additional refugees out. The Smyrna Theater became the American headquarters ashore. Within a day or two, many more Turkish troops had arrived, Vice Consul Maynard Barnes reported that both regular soldiers and officers were looting and killing. From the nearby Collegiate Institute, several people witnessed the woman who lived in a building across the street being surrounded by Turkish soldiers in this early period. Soldiers robbed her and told her rings, tore her rings from her fingers. When they finished, one of the Turks stepped back and cut off one of her hands with a sword. She was never seen again. By day, looting and killing continued. And now Americans reported that Greek and Armenian men were being collected in groups by military authorities and beach being marched out of the city to face firing squads. A sailor named Kay Hall told Commander Naus about watching over the wall of the American Collegiate Institute and seeing a family detained. A girl of 15 was taken from her parents into an alley after which her shrieks were clearly audible. The Turks returned and before leading the parents away, one of them wiped a bloody knife on a mother's forearm. As for Consul Horton, the day Navy Captain Hepburn came to Smyrna, he noted Horton had about reached the limit of his physical endurance and seeing all of the horrors he had seen. Although his strenuous efforts were credited with saving hundreds of lives, by this time the consul was near breaking down. Hepburn had the consul sent to, American, uh, to Athens on a first ship. So much for just a few of many possible pictures of the first days of Turkish occupation of Smyrna. Uh, beginning of the night. On the 13th, American sailors noticed fires being set in the Armenian quarter. The sailors believed they had been set to drive the thousand refugees sheltering, and, uh, sheltering in that spot into the streets, thus offering further victims for attack and plunder. With a strong wind blowing from the southeast toward the quay and the rich European areas and away from the Turkish district, the fire grew quickly. By 5 o'clock, the blaze had become such a holocaust that it was clearly destined to reach the foreign consulates at the water's edge. Every living thing fled to the waterfront. Frantic holes, horses and mules, herds of sheep, Greek peasants from the interior, local Greek and Armenian merchants, European residents. From there, the refugees began to plead with anyone in the consulates or with sailors out, sailors out in the warship anchorage. The USS Litchfield's stern was right nearby the, qu the quay to save them from the fire. But each country was busy saving its own. On the early evening of the 13th, this was a spectacle, spectacle as it appeared to Captain Hepburn on the stern of the Litchfield. The broad waterfront street appeared to be one solidly packed mass of humanity, domestic animals, vehicles, and luggage. Beyond, still separated from the crowd by a few short unburned blocks, the city was a mass of flame driving directly down on the waterfront before a stiff breeze. Mingled with the noise of the winds and flames and the crash of falling buildings were the sounds of frequent sharp reports such as might have been made either by rifle fire or the explosion of small arms, ammunition, and bombs in the burning area, high above all other sounds was a continuous wail of terror from the multitude. 
Those refugees who found a way to get out of the city toward the east were forced back into the inferno by Turkish soldiers. And I just read within the last uh, day uh, that there were Turkish machine gun nests set at each end of the, of the clay. Fire grew throughout the night. Admiral Bristol's intelligence officer, Lieutenant Merrill, had taken a quick trip on a destroyer to Constantinople and back. When he came back, he thought that those on the quay were lucky there was a sea breeze or they would have been roasted alive. Four cars and two trucks packed at the doorway, parked at the doorway of the Smyrna Theater were in fact burned to cinders. Packs belonging to the refugees caught fire, making a chain of bonfires linked to the street. And if the pack on a horse's back began to burn, the horse would stampede at top speed throughout the mass, flinging injury and death and raising terror to yet another level. Many of the refugees ended up in the water. We're talking about hundreds, maybe even thousands. Some of them were out of their wits, while others were forced off the quay by all the push and shove. Most of them drowned as few peasants could swim. A few refugees plunged in on purpose to swim off the ships. Those who swam to American British ships on the 13th often found themselves unwelcome. The British actually poured hot water down upon many swimmers to discourage them. 40 to 1 report. Several hundred refugees crowded upon a lighter along the side of the clay, hoping somebody would tow them out to the harbor, only to have Turks cover them with all with oil or kerosene and burn them to death. This event might seem incredible, yet separate reports about it came from several witnesses, including Emily McCallum, who saw some of the charred bodies, and from an Italian who told a witnessing of the event in a letter he wrote to the American Secretary of State, Charles Evan Hughes. The latter and her individual was Theodore Bartoli, a businessman from Smyrna, in his letter, which I found at the National Archives, Besides describing the lighters burning, Bartoli also expressed his gratitude for the efforts of two American sailors who had helped him bury both his mother, who had been hit by a stray bullet while embarking on an Italian merchant ship, and his two sisters, who had committed suicide when the Turks broke into their house rather than be raped and killed. What I saw, what I lived through during 25 days is horrible, he wrote. I saw young girls of 15 years to 20 have their throats cut at the seashore. I saw innocent adolescents have their eyes put out. I saw hundreds of refugees throw themselves into the sea which they, while they fled from the conflagration finding a worse death. All this was accomplished before the eyes of the powers represented by the officers and sailors of the battleships anchored close by. Equally bitter in later recollection was a young Armenian woman not only did she notice the British pouring boiling water down on swimmers, but in addition, she saw that the Americans were lined up on their destroyer decks, their movie cameras turning. She was not the only person to react at, in utter disbelief at the latter's sight. Again, Captain Hepburn was stymied by his orders not to cooperate in arranging any kind of humanitarian endeavors. But this, even the sailors aboard the ships, the Navy ships, were getting more and more upset their officers' failure to do anything. For the fire, American relief officials had been doing their best to feed several thousands of refugees. Now watching an anguish from the decks of the, the destroyer during the fire, they began wondering what they could do. And here we begin to see the actions and initiative taken by American civilians rather than the American Navy, which was to become characteristic during Smyrna. These civilians first asked Captain Hepburn to let them take a boat in. Perhaps they might move a large lighter over to the pier, put refugees on it, and tow a group to safety. Hepburn demurred. Their boat wasn't big enough. Well, maybe Hepburn could get the French or British to send their many large boats to the rescue. Again, those countries both have battleships present, not just dinky destroyers. Not unwilling, but no doubt keeping in mind Bristol's desire that the Americans go their own course, not cooperate with the Allies, nor displease the Turks, Hepburn let Davis, one of these Americans, go himself go to offer the British this proposition. At first, the British Admiral Osmond Brock also refused to do anything. He had assured uh, one of the Turk, uh, leading Turks of Britain's absolute neutrality. He could not, would not allow his men to take part in the rescue of Greek and Armenian citizens. However, the British Chief of Staff argued with such vehemence that Admiral Brock eventually changed his mind. When he did, there was nothing half-hearted about the British response. Navy man Hepburn found his subsequent action quite moving. It was evidently a squadron signal for away all boats, and the manner in which it was performed made a stirring spectacle. In spite of the lateness of the hour, well past midnight, it was only a few minutes after Davis returned on board that the first boats came sweeping in, all pulling boats, large enough to be of service as well as power launches, 
Crews in uniform and boat officers of all ranks from captain to midshipman. And British pulling boats oared launches. And power boats began making a regular run between the ships and the harbor and the pier, taking refugees aboard and carrying them to safety. They would put almost 700 refugees on the destroyer Litchfield and others uh, on the American merchant ship Winona, but they would load many, many more thousands aboard of European ships in the harbor till the latter could ta literally take no more. Together, they saved thousands, Dobkin estimated 20,000. Even with the British effort, rescue had barely dented the blast black mass of refugees, and the next day, as the fire continued to rage, uh, at the plea of relief for Jaquith, uh, Hepburn agreed to a further deviation from strict neutrality and put hundreds of orphans and various other refugees who had been under the American protection aboard the steamship Winona. This vessel would eventually sail for Piraeus with almost 2,000 refugees. In their official reports and discussions with the news media, both at that time and later, America has attempted to assess the cause of the fire. Several noted then or later that ethnic Greeks or Armenians had beforehand threatened to burn the city were the Turks ever to take it, but no American seems to have witnessed them acting on those events, on those threats. Several Americans and several locals did report seeing Turkish incendiaries. About noon on the 13th, the Blue Jack at the Collegiate, at the Collegiate Institute drew many mills to the window to watch Turks setting fires in nearby houses. Together they watched regular Turkish soldiers in sharp uniforms carrying tins of petroleum into a house after house. Soon after that they left, each building would burst into flames. I need not to go into this much further, uh, but before Dobkin's book, there were many arguments as to who set the fire. Uh, Turks, uh, Armenians and Greeks, in great anger at what was happening to them. That was one reason, that was perhaps the key reason Marjorie wrote her book, is to find out who set the fire, but she eventually did much more than that and painted the whole picture. Uh, I think her book makes clear uh, that the Turks set the fire very much on purpose. Really, my view is that besides all the witnesses who saw Turks setting the torch, in the face of the Turks' overwhelming power in Smyrna, especially after several days of brutal Turkish occupation, the notion that an organized body of Greeks or Armenians could have found the freedom to start, restart, and spread the fires, still sometimes argued in print and often on the internet, seems simply absurd. Before the fire and after it had burned itself out, sailors from every nation, represented by those warships in the harbor, worked to evacuate their own citizens, and maybe a few non-citizens. If you could speak just a few words of French, the French would take you, for instance, but not the Americans. Captain Hepburn was still attempting religiously to adhere to his orders, only Americans. A few examples will suffice. By now, Hepburn had decided to evacuate uh, the Americans. Again, though, bound by Bristol's orders to be neutral, restricting naval activity to the protection of Americans' lives and property, he was still holding the line there, only citizens. American teacher named John Kingsley Burge reached his Sensen by boat, and Hepburn invited them aboard, but finding the man had also brought along some female Armenian students and teachers, Captain ordered all those sent back. A subordinate officer insisted he would be sending these women to their deaths, and Hepburn finally gave in. He had the women sent below, and they eventually got out of Smyrna. Bit later, ashore at the theater, Hepburn personally stood in the way of Burge's wife Anna, who had brought along with her, besides her own three children, eight male Greek and Armenian students from the American college south of the city, orphan survivors from earlier massacres, uh, who Anna had been looking after for three years. When Captain Hepburn argued these boys could not all be her children, and insisted that only American families could be evacuated, this determined woman convinced eight families standing nearby to adopt one lad apiece. With such insistent defiance in the face of the Navy captain, she managed to get her boys out to the Simpson and collect them there, and then they all got away as well. Another group was not so lucky. Even though he had allowed his exceptions before, after the fire burned down, Hepburn was back to insist that, that only American citizens could be evacuated. There are still a couple hundred or, who knows, 300,000 refugees on the pier if you understand, haven't been evacuated. Hence it happened that when a truckload of male Armenian students from the American College were brought along, officials at the college, believing that no one would have the heart to leave these young men behind, an angry Hepburn had them all set back on the same truck. Survivor accounts agree that in most cases involving such groups of minority men left behind, only one in ten or even fewer would survive. As for the rest of the refugees, uh, the old men, women, and children, 
for almost all the men who were being uh, detained in labor battalions or simply massacred. Um, they, these old men, women, and children were clustered on that mile and a half stretch of the great Smyrna Quay. The place had become a reeking sewer. Refugees stayed there for nearly a week. At this point, they stayed there for another week afterward. There were no toilets. Uh, they were uh, there were all the many hundreds, maybe thousands, of decaying bodies there in the harbor water and on the pier. Many older refugees just died from stress and were simply cast into the sea. Families were broken up. Children and grandparents were lost. Turks appropriated good-looking young women for their harems. It was particularly terrible at night. And still, there was no rescue in the offing. Finally, a few days after the fire burned itself out, Captain Hepburn and several American civilians traveled back to Constantinople to tell the Admiral what they had seen. Hepburn had finally come to the conclusion that a massive international act evacuation was the only answer and laid out his case to the Admiral. And Robresto eventually agreed in a conference that his destroyers would start a shuttle carrying refugees out of Smyrna to Middle East and Constantinople and back. But after a trip or two with maybe a few hundred refugees, Bristol found other things for his ships to do. Despite there being hundreds of thousands still frantic and dying on the pier, no solution in sight. He didn't even let Captain Hepburn return to Smyrna. Let the Allies handle these things, he seemed to say. And so American command at Smyrna thus passed to the next senior officer present, Commander Wetzel, Commander Halsey Powell. On the 17th, the day after Hepburn left, Powell found that the Turks were openly acknowledging they had sent many Greek mar uh, Greeks on death marches inland. Meantime, the suffering and dying continued. Those on the quay were weeping, praying for ships, and all the great warships in the harbor, the sight of which had so comforted Smyrna's citizens while the Turkey's, uh, Turkish army was on its way there. How could the Turks do anything terrible with all those great ships in the harbor? Those great warships did little <coughs> or nothing. Indeed, their officers made formal, formal dinners aboard their ships, made formal calls on one ship to another. Their ship bands played at night, far into the night, and if not their bands, the Victrolas were always playing, and Caruso could be heard uh, trying to drown out the great terrible cries on the Smyrna Quay. And so it was, the initiative for dealing decisively with it, the disaster was taken by not any naval figure, but by an American civilian who really did find the refugees' predicament heartbreaking. Asa, Asa Jennings was a YMCA boys worker who had arrived in Smyrna with his wife and two boys only a month or two before the fire. He only stood five foot two, but he was a bundle of nerves and energy. Though he had only been working in Turkey a short time, he immediately understood the dangers the Armenians and Greeks faced. During the fire and afterwards, he took the initiative to protect some of the most helpless among the refugees. For instance, as the fire burned itself out, he gathered into a house on the quay the many refugee women about to give birth, several, uh, and then other uh, women who wanted, got into the building later. Several of the latter were young Armenian or Greek women that American Blue Jackets or their officers had rescued from Turkish soldiers leading the girls down the street. Years later, Red Condon was to recall that his American, young American naval officer escorting 50 young Armenian women to a safe haven in Smyrna, probably this very house, to protect them while en route, Condon and his fellows had the girls fashion their hair and dress as if they were children of eight, though they were in fact close to 15 and hence in substantial danger. The naval party succeeded in getting the girls to safety. As the day, as days wore on though and transports did not arrive, the British brought two ships on the 19th which would take away a few thousand, but that just tantalized the great throng. Jennings found his soul increasingly tormented. A religious man, Jennings frequently prayed, but he also acted. At one point, when a young woman was seen swimming near an American destroyer whose sailors would do nothing to save her, they explained they could not act without orders, and their officers would not issue any, a prime example of the other enfeeblement created by Bristol's insistence on neutrality, Jennings erupted, well, I'll order it. Push off that boat. The sailors quickly rescued the girl. On the 20th, a week after the fire and still nothing happening, Jennings woke determined to do something. He climbed aboard an Italian ship called the Constantinopoli, which was moored at a wharf. Uh, though this captain was also reluctant, shortly Jennings offered a sum, probably from relief funds, and the captain agreed to take a group. Now would the Turks allow the evacuation? Yes, they would, he was told, but no draft age males. Jennings and others worked all night. In the morning, the Americans found a squad of Turkish soldiers delegated to scan the refugees as they boarded the vessel. Some minority men who had disguised themselves 
were detected right on the dock, and the grief of the families as the men were marched away was heartrending. However, as Jennings later pointed out, it was either play the game as the Turks said it or not play it at all, and this kind of event took place again and again and again. The ship sailed the following afternoon with 2,000 refugees. To help ensure all of them could be landed at the nearby Mytilene, the ship's captain had insisted that Jennings ride the ship there. On boarding, the relief worker could hardly make his way through the crowd. They fell at my feet in gratitude. They kissed me. Old men got to their knees, on their knees, kissing my hands and feet, tears streaming down their faces. But the great rescue had not yet begun. About midnight, when the slow steamer finally got into Mytilene Harbor, the astonished passengers began cursing. There in the harbor, just a few hours steaming from Smyrna, lay some 20 Greek passenger ships, all riding high. These were the vessels that had recently transported many of the retreating Greek army away from the Turkish coast. After he landed the refugees, Jennings approached the Greek general, Frankos, who was present, who described the terrible need and asked if the Greek ships could return to Smyrna to, uh, you know, uh, uh, shorten the story. Basically, he said no. Finally, Jennings marched out in disgust, saw what he thought was an American battleship in the harbor. It was the Kilkis, which had been sold to the Greeks. Uh, we used to have been the Mississippi uh, many years before. It was an American battleship, but now it was in the Greek Navy. And this guy, the uh, captain of that ship, agreed to have him um, send a message to Athens. He had decided to appeal directly to the Greek government. The response of Athens was, of course, who are you? Uh, the American, uh, uh, head of the American relief at Medellini, he said. Of course, he was the only American there. Uh, he signaled back, and perhaps he was. Another message from Athens announced that the Prime Minister would consult the cabinet at 9 o'clock the next day. They wanted all sorts of assurances that he couldn't give them, that the American that ships wouldn't be taken over by the Turks and so on. And the Americans hadn't agreed, hadn't agreed to fight or anything. Finally, um, he was increasingly fl uh, frustrated. Recollecting all those folks awaiting certain death there on the quay, Jennings decided to try the last, an ultimatum. Unless the cabinet ordered the vessels to Smyrna, he threatened to wire openly without code to whoever, whoever might listen that the Greek government had refused to release their own ships to save tens of thousands of ethnic Greeks facing certain death. It was an astonishing bluff, but at about 6 that evening, he received the wire back, all ships in the Aegean placed your command, remove refugees Smyrna. Asa Jennings had just effectually been made an admiral in the Greek Navy and placed in a charge, a charge of a fleet of 50 transports. With such authorization, the other problems uh, were taken care of very quickly. The Greek ships couldn't fly their flags. American destroyers would let them into the harbor. And Jennings himself <coughs> had to ride the first ship, even though the only thing about, he knew about ships was to be sick on them. Uh, and so, once they got there, 10 vessels got underway, um, having uh, they steamed towards Smyrna under the escort of the USS Lawrence. I don't need to tell you, spend a lot of time what happened the next week. The ships reached the harbor to great rejoicing, eventually docked along the railroad pier, soon began loading refugees. The Turks oversaw the long lines of refugees, set up five Turkish examination barriers for each refugee to pass through, so as to make sure the military age males didn't get through, and incidentally to help them rob the refugees of whatever they still possessed. Took the refugees, Americans still to all the necessary coordination, took the refugees from the last period of the ships, and they're far away from the Turks who hated the British. British sailors stowed the refugees below decks. This process took seven days. A total of 190,000 were evacuated, though there were many, many deaths even during the loading and even then on the ships themselves. Jennings ships then began transporting other refugees from ports throughout the coast of Turkey, which continued for months. Uh, even a year, for after Smyrna, the Turks insisted that all Greeks and Armenians still living in Turkey leave the country, or else they would be deported to the interior, which death threat called hundreds of thousands more to flock to the sea. <coughs> Greeks and Armenians left their homes and everything they had left behind and walked for days, even weeks, to the coast of Turkey. Many of them had never seen a sea before. Historians say that tens of thousands more deaths occurred because of this forced final exodus to the hands of the Turkish nationalists. Jennings ships or other transports took the refugees <coughs> on to Greece. Greece eventually took all the refugees in, Greek and Armenian alike, and told, but you know much more about what happened in Greece than I. What I can say for sure is that after these events, Americans at least soon forgot that there had ever been such a thing as an American, small American Black Sea fleet. Over the years, 
very few have wondered whatever happened at Smyrna and why. Thank you. Well, you paid quite a picture there, and you came with those words. Unfortunately, not a very pretty one at that. Uh, but that's why we commemorate this, so we don't forget and we keep it alive for this generation and future generations, so hopefully these things don't get repeated again, but again, as we said, they do. I'd like to open up in a few minutes that we have left. Uh, oh, by the way, you might be interested to know that we paid a lot of, we paid, over the years, we paid a lot of respect to Mr. George uh, Council Horton, and last year at the, on the 90th anniversary, we actually uh, went to his grave site here, which is in Washington, D.C., and we had a small uh, ceremony there. Interesting. So uh, anyway, with that, we'll identify who you are and ask the question. Yeah, Nick Karambolis. Attorney, uh, may I ask you, uh, the Greek army, after the Battle of Sakaria, they were, of course, pushed to the coast. Yes. H how uh, were they evacuated, or were they just part of that mass yeah, of freedom? They were evacuated on the ships, the very ships that were in the Middle Eni Harbor they found, that they found later. They were evacuated on the ships. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they were still, there were still Greek stragglers coming to the, coming to the pier, or right. to, coming to Smyrna, and they were actually on the pier. Uh, where when the Turkish cavalry marched in, right. and so they rounded up the last of them, uh, and then of course they marched some sixty thousand, uh, six thousand of them through Smyrna and had them uh, uh, sound uh, shout, I guess, in, uh, in Turkish, long live Mustafa Kemal, uh, and so on. Uh, so. Uh, reportedly, in one report I saw just the other day, uh, 50,000 uh, had been captured before this. What happened to those Greek soldiers? Well, you and I can probably guess what happened to those Greek soldiers. Thank you. Let me ask you a question. I always found it kind of strange that all these hundreds of thousands were just sort of sequestered there on the quay, and, and the Turks just didn't like push them into the sea and just completely wipe them out. And afterwards, I never knew that they actually had a process in line, if you will, for the evacuation. Yeah. Like you would, like the Germans have, you know, during the Holocaust, as they took the prisoners off. They, they, they actually have the lines going back into the city and back out, you know, again. So there were five different gates at which you could, and of course the, the main purpose, the express, express purpose, was so that the uh, they could make sure no military men of military age were allowed to get through. Uh, again, virtually no, as uh, over overall, after, there were some, of course, who got away, but. Virtually nobody got away. Most of them were put in labor battalions. Those were not massacred or outright. Uh, and I have to, and, and the labor battalions don't didn't last long. They were given very little little food. Um, there was a exchange of populations later, but most most um, uh, but um, one has to realize that exchange of population. Um, uh, much of the exodus had taken place before before then. The exodus, uh, the, the Greek orders that all the Christians had to leave uh, uh, Turkey was uh, happened a long before that. Uh, so, um, and that's been expressed by many, many historians and others. Yes, sir. Identify yourself, please. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Haik Nafetian. I work with the Armenian Television Company. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed part of your uh, of your lecture. And Sorry if I'm being repetitive, but I know that both Armenians and Greeks were very wealthy in Izmir, Smyrna. And what happened to their property after they exceeded the, and, and after the city was burned? What uh, happened to this mine? Uh, most, most of the property was taken over, as m most of the property of the Christians, uh, minority, uh, um, you know, uh, Greeks and Armenians was taken over throughout uh, uh, Turkey. Um, and, and you know by you know by um, uh, Turkish families. Remember now there were also Turks being forced out of the Balkans, various m many places, and so they had to uh, find places for to place the uh, all those families. And so after the Armenian genocide of 1915 uh, and 16, Greeks and uh, Armenians who had fled and came back found their houses living lived in by by Turks, uh, who had their 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 houses, their rugs, uh, their their cattle in the fields. And this also took place, uh, um, happened with the Greeks who lived on the coast of uh, Ionia, many of whom have been forced away, came back and found that their houses were lived in by Turks. So most of it was taken away. Sorry, uh, from the perspective of international law, can uh, an American Armenian organization or American Greek organization try to pursue this case and try to maybe enforce somehow in order to try uh, to pay back? I, I'm not an expert on that. I couldn't say. I have just read in 
Giles Milton's book on Smyrna, yeah, uh, yeah, on yeah. Paradise Lost, uh, one of those uh, great uh, wealthy Levantine families, families of uh, uh, Europeans who had been in Turkey forever, in Smyrna forever, but were still regarded themselves as European, uh, had, was still after, you know, in, in, at, in, at age 90 trying to get his, his property back in Smyrna that had been, had been taken over with little success. Any comments on that, Nick? Well, there's been an interesting case, the uh, Focas case, um, that had to do with the uh, uh, ethnic Greeks who inherited property uh, that was located in, in Turkey, uh, <laughs> and they uh, won a uh, judgment uh, from the European Court of Human Rights, um, and uh, that may set a stage for um, other uh, challenges, but bear in mind to go to the European Court of Human Rights, you have to exhaust your domestic remedies, meaning you have to take the case fully through the Turkish courts uh, before you can take the case to the European. Okay, yes sir. I'm um, Captain Panagadopoulos, the Naval the Shell of Fort Wishon at Western DC. Um, thank you, for, thank you uh, uh, first of all, for the good insight you gave us about uh, the facts in, uh, in Smyrna. Uh, I, I, I might have, have uh, missed the point. In, in the beginning, uh, the American ships were ordered to go outside of, uh, to sail outside of uh, Smyrna to evacuate American citizens and not get involved in, uh, yes. in the fight between the uh, Greeks and, uh, yes. and Turkish. And, uh, uh, but but what, what happened and changed uh, the um, and their their uh, attitude, and they got involved in the. Well, first of all, we had this American uh, civilian, yeah. this missionary, this boys <coughs> worker, who took the uh, uh, and took the initiative himself, and so it's a little obscure as to exactly that. Uh, but Halsey Powell apparently did coordinate with the admiral, okay, uh, and the admiral made certain conditions. Uh, so. Probably through Housie Powell. Uh, and we'll, we'll learn more about this. There's another book that will come out, I don't uh, know how soon, by another person who is going into that in, in great detail. That's a good question. And that's one of the questions he has he's come up with uh, some of the, the, uh, the documents where Powell had to negotiate with Bristol uh, to let this happen. Uh, and so, yes, good question. Uh, Basically, it was the American civilian who took charge, who got the Greek ships to go, and so given yeah. that, that you know, it was not the Navy was doing this, uh, Bristol um, was apparently persuaded one way or another to let it happen. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, I'll land it on this. Uh, you're a naval, for, a naval officer, yes. reserve. Uh, I, I believe you say you also teach at uh, the Naval Academy. I taught at the Naval Academy and Air Force Academy before. Uh, as, a, as a reserve officer on active duty, I wore a uniform as a commander in the Navy uh, while I was teaching there, English. Regarding, again, I don't know what the, what, what the curriculum is of naval, you know, uh, U.S. naval ships in different actions, you mm -hmm. know, during the course of the 20th and 21st century. I think you alluded to it, but this is never mentioned in any capacity? No, 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 no I'm not a naval historian. <coughs> on the other hand, I found the naval historians who never touched this topic. Zero. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was an article here, an article there over, over uh, uh, 80 years. And so that's one of the reasons I decided I would take this topic on. There were some people who pleaded, some historians, head of the, naval his, the American Naval History Society, pleaded that there be somebody take, take this up as a subject. So I'm the first guy who's really uh, brought it up after Dobkin's book. But of course, Mobson's book is not focused specifically on the Navy, but uses many of the naval documents because much, uh, because there were uh, reports that kept going back to Admiral Bristol from uh, Hepburn, from several of the officers, uh, some of the, from some of the uh, civilian uh, uh, people who had, had been there. Uh, and so many of, and then of course there are other reports that she found, I found some, uh, from from sailors who had been there and had this eyewitness account, but no, uh, it's not. Uh, and as far as I know, it won't still be uh, much of a topic for the American Navy, who of course has World War II, which keeps going on and on and on and on in terms of your, the books written about World War II. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, but there's no no gun is fired, right? There's another reason. There's not a gun shot. No, no, as far as I know, not one, one uh, naval gun is shot through all this time. One sailor apparently killed a Turk because he was trying to take over the car and swim. That's about all that, I, that was done. And so you can understand uh, 
we're all fighting guys in the Navy, and so you know that's that's what we're interested in. Well, we thank you for at least raising this level of awareness uh, with to some degree within the Navy, and uh, we appreciate uh, you taking the time to come up from New Orleans today and to present to our noon forum. Uh, and with that, we will wrap it up. I just want to recognize that we do have members of the, the Greek Embassy here and the Cyprus Embassy here, including the military attaches of the Naval and Defense attaches. And just to remind you all that we are going to be celebrating another uh, noon forum here in a couple of weeks with none other than Jim Marquetos, who will talk about Oiki Day, and the topic will be the Greek War Relief, America's formidable response to famine in World War II Greece. So please uh, come out for that, and we will put out an announcement. So we thank you once again, and uh, let's have a nice round of applause here for us. I, I, uh, I, I printed up some uh, photos. They're yeah. out there on the table there, if you'd like to know. Yoria will pass these out for you as you go out, and there's some food and drink in the